welcome to the show where we share the stories of the many who intersect with our healthcare system but are rarely heard from. My name is Kevin Poe, founder and editor of Kevin MD. Today in the show, we have Vincent Roddy. He is an emergency physician and he wrote the Kevin MD article, The Goal of Healthcare is in Peril. Vincent, welcome to the Kevin, pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me. We'll get into your article in a little bit, but first off, can you share your story and journey to where you are today? Yes, uh, I'm originally from Northern Virginia. Uh, I grew up right outside of the DC area. Uh, I was uh, fortunate enough to go to Duke University uh, where I was an econ major pre-med uh, many years ago. I'm not gonna tell you the year I graduated, but I uh, went to Duke I then was able to go to Virginia Commonwealth University uh, School of Medicine in Richmond, Virginia for med school. I then matched emergency medicine at Mount Sinai in New York City. So I worked between uh, Manhattan at Mount Sinai uh, and Elmer's Hospital in Queens. That was for four years. Very proud and, and, and just had an, such a great experience in New York City. And for the last several years, I've been working here in South Florida. I'm based in Miami. I'm an emergency physician full-time, and I'm also a medical director of our department. So that's pretty much kind of my story. All right, we're speaking towards the end of January. Tell us what you're seeing in the emergency department today. I mean, we still see sick patients. We definitely still see sick patients. I would say that the Omicron wave is kind of on the downturn, but that's not to say that you can't still necessarily get sick with that. It's, it wasn't as bad as the, as the Delta variant, and it, it was definitely not as bad as the first wave, but you know, COVID still comes into the emergency department. Patients can still get it. The difference now between then is that the stay-at-home orders are no longer in place. And so it's COVID patients mixed up with, you know, the regular type of presentation stuff that you'd see in the ER. Uh, and that can sometimes obviously cause some, some throughput issues and some wait times. So you mentioned that uh, you've been practicing emergency medicine for several years now. You're now medical director. What are some of the challenges that face emergency medicine? I mean, honestly, the challenges of emergency medicine are kind of reflective of the challenges of the, uh, the overall healthcare system. Mm -hmm. The main issue affecting hospitals in the United States right now and ERs around the country are really just lack of qualified staff. I mean, we do have physicians, obviously, but there's just really not enough nurses. There's not enough ancillary support like techs and, and you know, pretty much nurses and techs. I mean, that's the issue. And so you can come and the physicians will be there to see you, but sometimes, you know, you, it might be a challenge with having the support staff around the physicians to service the patients and to give the needed uh, services the patients require. So you talk more about that in your Kevin MD article titled, The Goal of Healthcare is in Peril. Now, for those who didn't get a chance to read your article, can you just walk my audience through it and share the story of why you decided? Yeah, you know, I mean, the goal is in peril. I mean, that was the original title of the article, The Goal of Healthcare is in Peril. I'm currently doing my MBA at Duke University, my executive MBA. So in term five, we were taking two classes. We were taking uh, managerial accounting. We were taking operations management. And these, these topics are like highly related to one another. And the more I learned in those classes, the more I saw what we were, we were learning was related to what I do in the emergency department. You know, operations is throughput and the managerial accounting aspect is really just the finances that people don't really think about or, or know about in the background that allows the hospital to function. And, you know, essentially what happened during the pandemic was that stay-at-home orders went into effect almost overnight when the stay-at-home orders went into effect in Florida, ER volumes dropped by 50%, 50 to 60%. Now, you know, you might not think that this is a problem, but it is because the hospital is an organization that has, you know, a financial structure that has to be considered. And if patient volumes drop, you have to suddenly cut your staffing hours. So now suddenly we're in a pandemic, people are used to, you know, being paid and having hours on the schedule. You have to decrease nursing staffing hours and you have to decrease physician hours because the patient volumes have decreased so much. And that issue has persisted throughout the pandemic. I can tell you that in area hospitals in South Florida, volumes in some places have come back, maybe 90% or so. But in other hospitals, the volumes have still persistently decreased, you know, 40% than what they were pre-pandemic. And so this is a problem because staffing hours have been cut. The patients that actually do come to the hospital are still incredibly sick. So there's less staff at the hospital waiting to greet patients when they come. We do the best that we can do, but patients might wait a little longer. Sometimes health, health outcomes can be put at risk as a result of, of waiting longer. And a lot of, you know, elective, you know, outpatient surgical procedures and, you know, other services have been decreased from the hospital purely because it's just not the patients coming. I mean, the revenue that the patients would, would earn is no longer there. So they have to decrease services to kind of make themselves whole financially. That's a problem. So tell us a story about all of these statistics and, and numbers that you had just mentioned. Can you tell us a story or a case study about how a specific patient has been adversely affected by the, the lack of techs and nurses and, and some of the issues that you just described? How does this specifically affect a patient that you can remember? 
I want to be very clear. I mean, if you're if you're sick and you come to the hospital, we're going to do everything that we can do to service your community. But just what I've seen in my experience is that, for example, patients come to the hospital, you know, for you know, they might have to wait a little longer than they might have previously waited purely because there's just not staff there to service you. Uh, the best example I can use really is in the stock market. And, and most people have probably seen this before in movies or in, in, in film or something like that. You know, in the, in the New York Stock Exchange, when they're trading stocks, there's so many people there to take your order, right? I actually looked at this. I believe the New York Stock Exchange only operates at maybe 20% utilization, meaning that there's so many workers there that only maybe 20% of them are, are ever busy at any particular time taking the orders and, and, and doing the things that they need to do to help these financial transactions. In the hospital, people are at 100% utilization all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, there's just enough staff to actually meet the patient arrivals. And if you decrease staffing hours, despite the fact that patient arrivals has decreased, everyone is still at 100%. So... For example, in the Delta variant surge, you know, a few months back, it was very difficult to meet that increased demand. As the patients came, as they were sick with Delta, and even a few you know, months ago with Omicron or a few weeks ago with Omicron, as more and more people came to the hospital, you were not able to increase the staffing the way that we needed to because there's national nursing shortages and whatnot. And so, you know, it just kind of was a, a tough situation. It was stressful. I mean, patients maybe waited a little longer than they would have otherwise. And as I said before, I mean, hospitals uh, have decreased some of the services that they offer purely because they just don't have the, uh, the, the staff that they need to support these things. Now, what are some of your answers that would solve some of these issues? We hear obviously about the great resignation. I hear about nurses all the time going to, to travel companies and these yeah. travel companies offer these nurses several times more the pay that a hospital can offer them. Now, what's your solutions to get us out of this mess? So I mentioned this in the article and what, what your viewers need to understand is that being a healthcare worker, this is actually like really hard work. It's not necessarily glamorous work. The people that are drawn to this profession do it because they, they truly want to help people. But when you're in it, it's, it's hard work. I mean, you're serving people all the time. And sometimes the patients are sick. Sometimes the patients are a little irritable. Sometimes the patients don't understand that they might have to wait because you're dealing with another patient. So that is the reality of healthcare that, that I'm not sure if people truly understand. And so what has happened is that you know, nurses have historically been underpaid in this country for the value that they bring. I mean, people should be paid at a level that is commensurate with the value that they bring. Now, what have we seen during the pandemic? We've seen that the essential healthcare workers, the physicians, the nurses, the techs, the respiratory therapists, the custodial staff in the hospital, or even our unit secretaries, these people are truly essential workers because if they're not there, the whole hospital system will literally shut down. You will come to the hospital, there won't be enough nurses, there won't be enough techs, and you'll have to wait. And that could potentially put your health at risk. So historically, these people have been underpaid, our nursing staff, the ancillary support staff, all this type of stuff. And it's really, really hard work. So when the pandemic happened and a lot of these companies decreased their hours because, you know, maybe they weren't in a COVID surge at that time, in the areas of the country that actually did have COVID surges, you know, they needed staff. So it created like a supply demand mismatch. So now suddenly, you know, hospitals in, in COVID hotspots that had, you know, more financial resources were willing to pay nurses three and four and five times the amount of money that they're normally paid purely to get them into their system so that they could actually see these patients. I mean, the, the reality is, is that it's created a, a capacity crisis for the hospitals that can't do that. So like if you're in like a poor area or working in a hospital that does not have as many financial resources and they can't afford to pay these nurses more money, then there's just not going to be enough staff to service the patients. And I talk about this in detail uh, in the article. With regard to, you know, what the solutions could be, I mean, really, the federal government needs to do more to shore up the, you know, the, 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 the worker shortages that exist right now as far as nurses go in this country. That situation is projected to get worse over the next 10 to 15 to 20 years as more and more of our nurses are either leaving the profession uh, to become nurse practitioners. Many of, that is, is, or many of them have been motivated, I guess, uh, you know, for financial concerns to do that. I mean, a, a regular bedside nurse is not going to be paid as much as a nurse practitioner. And then many of the regular nurses or the, 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 the clinical nurses that we need in the department and around the hospital have left and taken the lucrative traveling jobs, as, as we said before. But all of this has been as a result of just nurses being underpaid to begin with. I mean, had they been paid at a level that was commensurate with the value that they were bringing to the healthcare system to begin with, I don't think that we'd have these problems. And it's disappointing to kind of see that the federal government's not doing more to address this. The federal government needs to do more to address, you know, the pay inequities that exist within healthcare as far as our support staff. Private industry could probably do more as well, maybe with federal assistance. I mentioned in the article that historically in the United States, we've been recruiting nurses from the Philippines to meet our healthcare needs as far back as the 1960s. We should probably look at bringing more foreign born qualified nurses into this country as we're having, you know, our population is aging. 
as more and more nurses are leaving the profession and as you know the demand for healthcare services is not going down in this country so in short the whole purpose of the article was just saying that the goal of healthcare is to provide on-demand services for people in this country. The only way that you can do that is that if you actually have the staff there mm -hmm. to, to provide the needed capacity and resources to do that. Currently in the United States, we do not have the staffing capacity and resources that we need. We're not producing enough nurses. Nurses are leaving the profession to become nurse practitioners. If you ask many of them why, it's purely because a, a, a clinical nurse might make you know, $35 an hour was a nurse practitioner is going to make closer to 70 to $80 an hour, maybe even more than that. Right now, travel nurses are making $100, $150 an hour. I don't think that the $150 an hour for a travel nurse is necessarily sustainable, but I don't think that $35 an hour is necessarily fair for them either because I've seen them work during the, during the course of my career and they provide a, a tremendous value to our patients and to our healthcare system. So when I said the goal is in peril, what I'm saying is that we don't have the staff to, to, to run throughput for the patients. If you get sick in this country and you come to the hospital, you may have to wait longer than is ideal purely because there's just not enough staff there. And what we need from our politicians, our policymakers, from healthcare corporations is to do more to shore up our healthcare uh, workers. Uh, that we need to support them the same way that we need to support the patients. And, you know, in healthcare, there's sometimes taboo to talk about, you know, the financials of it. I mean, the reality is this, I mean, and we're, and we're talking about this in business school right now. There's a quote, it, it's, it's no profit, no purpose. Mm -hmm. Now, what does that mean? I mean, you need a margin in any business. You need a margin to keep the business open. You need a margin, a profit margin to pay the staff, to pay, to pay for your overhead expenses, to, you know, to recruit and retain people. And so in healthcare somehow in this country, you know, healthcare reform has been kind of pushed on healthcare workers. And you know, this is a physician, healthcare reform to the politicians is paying you less money for the work that you do, even though you're providing an on-demand healthcare service that patients need and require. That's not the answer. They want to decrease healthcare spending as a percentage of GDP in this country. I think we're at like 18% right now. They think it's unsustainable. It's going up. But true healthcare reform is not paying us less or paying the nurses less or paying the techs less for the needed services that we provide, particularly during a pandemic. True healthcare reform is paying the staff what they need to pay to provide the capacity so, that, so the patients can continue to get the services that they need while they need them on demand because we're first world country. Additionally, it would be encouraging people to live healthy lifestyles, aerobic exercise, diet and exercise, mental health services. If we invested in those things over the course of the next generation, 10, 15, 20 years, then you would see a decrease in healthcare spending as a percentage of GDP. But as physicians, we need to push back on people just essentially, you know, taking from us when we're the people actually providing the needed service. And so that is the, the real takeaway from the article. I mean, the goal is that we need to support nurses. We need to support techs. We need to support our custodial staff. We need to support the, you know, the unit secretaries that were, if they're not at work, you know, the whole throughput of the hospital, you know, becomes hamstrung. And I mean, I'm passionate about this, Kevin. I mean, I want us to do something about the capacity challenges and staff challenges that we face in this country. I'm currently in my last term of my MBA at Duke. And so this is like a, a, a pretty big research focus for me where I'm going to be spending the next maybe, you know, four to five months looking into this and hopefully coming up with, uh, with actionable solutions and, you know, implementable solutions for what we can do regarding our capacity challenges. But, you know, the goal is in peril. You heard it here first. And, you know, we're not seeing this on, you know, on television from the politicians or even from the news broadcasters. People are sick. They want, they want healthcare services and we have to provide them. Only over the long term of us living healthier lives can we really get the type of healthcare reform that we need and people living healthier lives and, and spending less on health? You know, we need to pay our nurses and we need to pay the staff to get the capacity we need. We're talking to Vincent Roddy. He is an emergency physician and he wrote to Kevin in the article, the goal of healthcare is in peril. Vincent, what kind of long-term effects do you see from these nursing and tech shortages? So I get the sense that the government, they, they may be waiting out the pandemic and hopefully as the pandemic dies out, then these nurses can come back. But I'm interested in hearing your perspective. What do you see as some of the lasting impacts from this great resignation and the shortage of techs and nurses? People need to realize that, you know, nurses, physicians, techs, custodial staff, all of these people truly are essential workers, essential. They must be paid at a level that is commensurate to the value that they bring. If you don't think that the healthcare service in this country, healthcare system in this country brings tremendous value, just imagine what it would have been like had we not had it during the pandemic, it would have been even more of a, a calamity and just a terrible situation. As far as the long-term lasting effects, I mean, I don't, a clinical nurse will never accept $35 an hour ever again. Why would mm -hmm. they? If there's contracts in Texas that are paying nurses $200 an hour, 
$150 an hour, $40,000, $50,000 a month, whatever it is, you know, for however many shifts that they would have to work. Why would they ever go back to living paycheck to paycheck, $35 an hour, knowing that the whole healthcare system is, is essentially depending on their services. Now, you asked my question as far as what's going to happen long term. I don't think that those rates are sustainable in the long term. But I do think that there needs to be some type of new steady state that exists with the nursing profession, because you have to pay them enough, no profit, no purpose. You have to pay the staff enough to come to motivate them, to come to work, to do this hard work. Yes. It's about patient care. Yes. It's about empathy. Yes. It's about putting the patient first, but at the same time, we live in a world where the cost of goods and services continues to rise, right? We live in a world where if you work hard, you should be able to provide, you know, basic necessities for your family, access to housing, education, food, clean water, clean air, that type of thing. Those things cost money. And that's just the reality. So long-term, there needs to be some type of evolution within the nursing profession where a new steady state is found. Because right now I believe there's 30,000 travel nursing positions in the United States, 30,000 open positions. Also the baby boomer generation is, is nearing retirement. Many of them are, are already retiring, already planning to retire or have already left the profession. This is at the same time that our population is aging. So the demand for services, you know, home health care services, nursing services, whatever, that's only going to continue to increase over the next 15 to 20 years. Also, if you look at the statistics right now, they're not making enough nurses in this country to meet that demand. So that supply demand mismatch is always going to be there. We need to do something to one, recruit more nurses into the profession. A financial incentive could be a part of that. No profit, no purpose. To retain the nurses that we have. Again, a financial incentive could be a part of that. Like, so many of our best nurses over the course of my career have left to become nurse practitioners. Why? Because a clinical nurse makes $35 an hour, a nurse practitioner might make $75, $75 to $100 an hour. Why would, why would they stay as a clinical nurse when they're excellent in what they do and they know that they could go to school to be a nurse practitioner for a year or two and they get this higher paying job? So that's also contributing to the exodus. In addition to the fact that just the mental health struggles of being a healthcare professional, you know, we put the patients first consistently Who's really looking out for us? And I'm not complaining. You'll never hear me complain as a physician. I chose to do this job. I've been saying I wanted to be a physician since I was a child. I feel very privileged to be in this position, to be able to serve, particularly during a time of need. However, you know, some people might need a little more, you know, support, you know, mentally, emotionally. Some people, as a medical director, I understand this. Some people need that, that pat on the back, that attaboy to keep them going. And I'm just not seeing enough uh, of that for them. And Again, in a world where the cost of goods and services is increasing, you just got to pay these people. Sometimes that's the answer. Let's pay them and get them to come to work and, and, and do what is needed. So again, pay them more to recruit more nurses to the profession, pay them more to retain the nurses that we have, the high quality nurses that we have, look into importing you know, foreign nurses that are qualified, obviously, into this country, maybe give them H H-1B visas. And again, we're looking into this heavily. I mean, we need to provide the solutions. I'm sorry, I don't want to just be a physician that just sees this problem and sits around and, and does nothing about it. Physicians should be the leaders of the healthcare system because we have the real equity in the healthcare system. Kevin, you and I went to medical school. Mm -hmm. We took years of our life to go to med school. We took years of our life to do, you know, residency. I did my residency in New York City. I distinctly remember being in the CCU overnight when the Giants won the Super Bowl. I mean, there's no better place in the world to be in uh, than in New York City if the Giants are in the Super Bowl. Was I out in a bar celebrating with the whole city when they won? No, I was at work. I mean, you and I have the equity. We have, we have the, uh, the credibility, I should say. Not to mention you probably helped, I don't know, 50,000 patients in your life. So we have all the patient testimonials too. I mean, physicians really should be the leaders of the healthcare system. This is part of the motivation to go to business school is to ultimately understand these things that we're not taught in medical school. And uh, because we care about the patients to put in actionable solutions to, uh, to give them the services they need. And my final question, Vincent, what are some of your take home messages that you want to leave with the Kevin and the audience? I mean, pretty much that you're going to hear a lot about this moving forward. I mean, I didn't touch on this specifically in the article, but you know, don't be seduced by the idea of healthcare reform. I mean, healthcare reform, as they discuss about it in aggregate, is really just paying physicians and nurses and techs less money than they currently pay us now in order to bring down this healthcare spend as a percentage of GDP. I should remind your, your viewers that I believe it's only 10% of the healthcare dollar actually gets spent on physicians and, and actual medical services. I mean, the rest of it is like administrative, pharmaceutical, device manufacturer, all of these other things. Mm -hmm. Real health, real healthcare reform would involve us living healthier lives so that we don't need the services as much and that we're not spending as much because we don't need the services. 
In the meantime, the goal is in peril, my friends. We need staff. The staff has to be paid well in order to do the work. The nurses, the physicians, the techs, the custodians, the, the unit secretaries, these are essential workers to the functioning of not only this of our economy and not only the health, but just to the country in general. This is a national security issue. And I would like to see the federal government do more to shore up our, our, our staffing issues so that we can have the capacity to serve you when you come. And, you know, despite our challenges, we're going to be here for you. But, it, but because I care about this country, because I care about the patients, because I care about our workers, I want things to be the best that they can be, just not good enough. Good enough just isn't. And that's how we've been operating in this country. And we need to do more so that you can have the services uh, that a first world country should afford its citizens. Thank you so much for sharing your time and insight. And thanks again for being on the show. Thanks so much for having me, Kevin. Look, hopefully I can come back at some point.